Great. Well, so thanks very much for everybody, every, to everybody for coming. Um, what I'm going to be chatting with you all today is some early work that our lab has been pursuing in the eastern Gulf of Mexico, um, trying to characterize the depositional architecture of the shelf margin east of the Mississippi uh, River Delta, but, um, but kind of connected to the Mobile uh, River Delta. And this, here are some horizons, a little animation from uh, the bottom of a sequence that we've been mapping to the seafloor, um, just kind of showing some of how the uh, stratigraphic architecture of the shelf margin is evolving um, in the eastern Gulf of Mexico. And the question that's really uh, driving um, the type of research that we're uh, pursuing is, um, is uh, this question. Uh, how did uh, sediment that's coming from a river, coming from a delta, how did it get to deep water? So um, what I'm going to show are a, a couple of uh, models for how how sediment uh, gets its way and how terrigenous sediment gets its way into into deep water um, uh, in the um, sort of middle part of the 20th century, um, and, and especially really really in, really starting in 1970, uh, folks that were working on um, deep water. Uh, Canyon and channel systems and continental margins offshore the west coast of the U.S. came up with a model where you have a, um, a single canyon that's being provided some kind of terrigenous sediment supply. And, and that single canyon transitions downstream into a more valley-like um, sort of morphology. This is like a map view of how this model works. And then it, and then it changes to a more levee channel type of morphology and stratigraphy. And, and it feeds these uh, depositional lobes that kind of fringe the the um, basin floor and the lower part of the slope. But then um, subsequent to that, um, uh, Paul Heller and Bill Dickinson noted while studying outcrops of Forark Basin Fill in, in Oregon of the Eocene Taiyi Formation, I think, that uh, you don't always have a single really well-defined canyon that's providing this terrigenous sediment flux downstream. Sometimes you can get deltas that form at the shelf edge, and they f and, and individual delta lobes, they're kind of hopping around, um, compensationally stacking across the shelf edge, and individual deposition or individual um, delta lobes can feed um, right to a multiple levee channel systems that feed kind of a more broad distribution of, of, uh, of lobes at, across the basin floor. So uh, the idea is, is that you have shelf edge deltas prograde to the shelf edge. Lots of lobe switching creates this broad arcuate delta complex that feeds multiple levee channel systems. Some are active, usually they're active like one at a time, like one delta lobe is a focus of terrigenous sediment delivery to the shelf margin, and it feeds one of these levee channel systems, and then it hops over after a few thousand years. Um, uh, where we're going to go to examine these types of processes is in the eastern Gulf of Mexico. Like I mentioned before, I showed you that animation of, of some of the development of the, um, of the deep water uh, channel systems and the shelf edge there. Um, so this is east of the Mississippi uh, Delta, and you can see a little piece of it just on the far left part of the screen. And then these black lines outline um, the approximate locations of uh, shelf edge deltas that are related to the Mobile River. And then, um, so, ah, shoot, wrong way. So, um, so what I'm going to be talking about is, is you have this broad swath of, uh, of delta um, deposits forming this delta complex. It's forming as a result of lobe switching at the shelf edge. And then you have multiple levee channel systems. You can see these uh, sort of more linear features at a broad scale that are descending from the shelf edge into relatively deep water. Lots of other interesting features on this slide. You get lots of salt diapirs that are influencing sediment routing pathways as well. So um, what this is all about is a review of um, some uh, past work on some of these levied channel systems linked to shelf edge deltas in the eastern GOM. Um, we're going to uh, ask the question, try to answer the question of what the heck is there, and, um, and, and particularly how does the interaction between the shelf edge deltas <clears throat> result in the initiation of deep water channels across this type of setting where you don't have like a really nice, clear, single, uh, deeply incised canyon um, that's providing sediment into deep water. So the next slide is going to be a um, seafloor map of this region that's in the black box. So I've rotated a little bit to fit it, um, fit the map as best I can across the screen. Um, so first we're going to document shelf edge uh, depositional architecture um, in a package of, of uh, stratigraphy that's from the seafloor. So this is a seafloor map with relatively shallow on the left and deep on the right. 
to um, the bottom of this sequence. So this is the bottom of uh, a sequence of deposits that is related to the um, shelf edge delta deposition and, and, and levee channel formation of the um, um, downstream of the Mobile River. Um, so we're going to try to, so what's there? We're going to try to address some key characterization challenges. And again, this is very early work for us. So, so we're not going to necessarily answer all these key characterization challenges of how big things are and, and exactly how they stack and then what their lithologies are. But we have the opportunity to do it with the data set that I'm going to show you in a few slides. Um, so I've labeled some features that I'll go into more detail uh, later. Um, but we're not just going to stop at characterization. We're, you know, a lot of what drives us is, you know, drives our lab, drives us as geoscientists is asking, or at least, you know, arm-waving, interpreting, hypothesizing on what exactly is controlling some of these features. We're not just about collecting data and just measuring stuff. We like to do that, but it's for a purpose, right? It's for a purpose of answering some kind of scientific question. So, um, so what are the controls on... Um, how to, on, on, on how the, the, the shelf margin is evolving over time, and specifically, how does the shelf edge delta link to the deep water channel? Um, so first, just to, again, this is just showing you where we're going with this presentation, but we think that the sediment supply from the mobile delta plays a really important role in the scales of channels that we see, and also um, the types of um, uh, structural architectural elements that manifest in the shallow subsurface of the shelf edge, like faults, um, uh, that kind of form a nucleation point for uh, mass wasting, and then that mass wasting, the sort of the scar that's left behind subsequent to that mass wasting, creates kind of a template that these channel systems follow, and, and it kind of governs where these channel systems form. Uh, and it's all fundamentally related to sediment supply from the up dip mobile uh, river delta. Uh, also, uh, <laughs> you know, the, there are salt diapirs here, which I'm not going to talk about too much. I showed this to some of this interpretation I'm going to show you, show you in, the, you know, in this, the course of this presentation to Mike Hudek, because we always want to bother him. Like he's the world expert on salt tectonics. We want to, we want to poke him about you know, structure, strat interaction, if there's opportunity here. And, and you know, I showed him that you get this, these channels that coalesce between two salt diapirs. And isn't that interesting? And he's like, yep, yeah, that's interesting. So. So that's kind of where I'm going to leave that uh, for now. Like maybe in the future, but for now, um, it's just kind of uh, um, well. Of course, that of course that's what happens. So, okay. So I'm um, starting with some uh, general ideas. So that was where we're going with this presentation, right? So now, first, now I'm going to go through some general ideas about how um, terrigenous sediment um, uh, gets routed into into deep water. And, and this is a diagram that I took from the SCPM Strata website. It's about, it's a lot of, it's like the, the most general way people think, and probably widely thought of way that many people think about, um, about shelves of basin floor sequences. Um, you have a deeply incised upstream canyon that feeds a, a fan that becomes less confined as you move from the slope to the, to the basin floor. And really the origin of that model um, comes from studies um, in the uh, 1950s and really culminating in the 1970s with the work of Bill Normark on submarine canyon fan systems in the uh, Southern California borderland. So here's an animation from north on the left to moving progressively farther south towards the Mexican-U.S. border, towards La Jolla and San Diego, of the various canyon and channel systems that these, um, that these like, really brilliant pioneering scientists at uh, the Scripps Institute for Oceanography and also USC um, studied, and you know you see a pr pretty narrow uh, shelf. It's less than 10 kilometers. Um, you see a deeply incised canyon at the shelf edge. This, and then you you know you transition to a less deeply incised, more U-shaped valley form. And then when you look on the basin floor, a lot of these um, channels are bounded by levees. And the first fan model, as far as I know, and I'm biased because I worked a lot with the guy that wrote the paper about it was a guy named Bill Normark, and he studied this system uh, here called the La Jolla Canyon uh, fan system. You can see a really deeply incised canyon, and then it becomes less, less you know, the, the relief diminishes of the channel system downstream, and then it feeds a little lobe at the end. So this is, uh, this is that paper from Bill uh, in 1970 called the Growth Patterns of Deep Sea Fan. As far as I know, I think it's the first... First, first, first study kind of putting all the pieces together, um, at least from the modern 
perspective about what the geomorphology, the surface uh, geomorphology and, and the shallow stratigraphy of some of these fan systems looks like. And this is the type of data, not data, this is, these are the types of maps that they generated based on the data that they had at the time. Um, so you have uh, you know, La Jolla right here, and, and um, the, the La Jolla uh, Canyon is this, and then there's a Scripps Canyon too, and it receives sediment, not from a river, but it receives sediment from a longshore drift. So you don't see a delta here that's forming at the mouth of this canyon providing turgeon sediment. It gets almost everything from, from longshore drift um, of, the, of a littoral cell that's... Uh, extends beyond the slide. Um, but, you know, this is a bathymetric map that they, that they developed, and, you know, things have changed over the last uh, 50 years. Uh, this is recently published uh, bathymetry by the USGS. Uh, Pete Dartnell, who's a great, you know, scientist, uh, geoscientist and, and, and collects a lot and assembles a lot of these bathymetric data sets for public consumption, um, put this together along with some of his colleagues at the USGS Coastal Marine Geology Center, um, and uh, I mean, it's just a beautiful image of what the, uh, um, not too far off from the broad, you know, topographic contours that you see in the Normark paper, but, you know, you can see some of the more, some more of the detail, like the trends, right, but then there's a lot more detail here about how the channel system's changing from a uh, canyon that's really deeply in size and capturing, you know, that terrigenous sediment from, that's being transported through, through the littoral cell by longshore currents to a, a U-shaped fan valley. You know, you know, it's getting a little bit less deeply incised. And, uh, and then at the distal reach, um, you know, the channel kind of maintains its width more or less all the way down to the basin floor. And then you start to not be able to see the channel as well, but you might be able to convince yourself that you have some splitting of distributary channels um, at the distal reach of this and feeding maybe depositional lobes. But it's very flat, so it's really hard to see that in this uh, top um, bathymetric data. That's kind of a, how a general fan model was born. Ooh. <clears throat> okay, so um, I have a movie that I like to play that was shot like in the um, in the or published in the, in the 60s, that talks about how sediment is transported by these longshore currents, and, and you know, turgeon sediment comes from the rivers, goes into the littoral zone, longshore currents transport the sediment into the head of this canyon. It just explains it like really eloquently. I worked on this for my dissertation. I thought it was really hot stuff when I published this paper in geology in 2007, and then I looked at this movie, and it basically says exactly what my paper said. It's like 50 or 60 years old. <laughs> um, anyway, but it's just great, and it's really good... Um, it does a great job of illustrating the point about how trigen sediment moves into these canyons and, and gets distributed across deep water. Just offshore is a branch of a submarine canyon. The canyon is about 20 miles long and extends to a depth of more than 3,000 feet. Now we know why the beach ends near the head of the submarine canyon. The river of sand is drained off down the canyon and onto the ocean bottom. The canyon is located here. Farther up coast, there are two other submarine canyons, each just offshore where a beach ends. A system of rivers feeds sand to each of the beaches. The sand is carried down the rivers and is moved southward along the beaches. The beaches end where the sand is drained off down the underwater canyons. I think that's it. Okay, that's kind of... Isn't that nice? That they said it much few, many fewer words and much more elegantly than I could have said it. So that's why I put that there. All right, so this is the model, right? This is the model that was developed in 1970, mostly focusing on these canyons in tectonically active Southern California. Lots of shallow marine reworking of turgenous sediment, not a lot of really nicely developed deltas. Um, so the key here is that you get this canyon developed and it transitions to those levee channels and those lobes. Um, but then, you know, uh, Heller and Dickinson... Um, noted from the Taiyi Formation that, you know, they couldn't find one of these major feeder canyons. Like, maybe it's something a little bit more like um, this cartoon that's on the bottom part of the screen. So, like, how does sediment get into deep water? It might be a different way than the conventional, like, really widely used fan, canyon fan model uh, predicts. You get lobe switching at the shelf edge here. It creates this broad arcuate delta complex. Each of the individual delta lobes feed multiple of these uh, levee channels uh, on the slope. And uh, recently, I'll give you some examples of where this type of um, 
uh, scenario has uh, been recognized with the advent of like high resolution um, bathymetric and subsurface data sets, um, mostly in the Gulf of Mexico, but also in um, in uh, or in the Gulf of Mexico and and, and offshore of South America. Uh, I was just on. I was recently on a PhD committee for a, a really uh, clever guy that was working with Morig and Gulick and um, and John Goff named um, uh, John Schwartz, and he studied the Rio Grande deep water depositional system that's linked to, among other things, that's linked to the Rio Grande River. Um, so, you know, here's the Gulf of Mexico, and then I threw on some modern sediment load measurements from John Milliman and, and Katie Farn Farnsworth, and then the next slide is going to be this uh, black box region. So you get a, you know, a big river, you know, but it's, it's an arid river, big, big river feeding a, uh, the, the margin in the western Gulf of Mexico. So zooming in, um, there's this protuberance of the shelf here. That's the Rio Grande uh, Delta and uh, shelf edge delta. And then you see all these, maybe it's a little tricky to see, but you get salt eye appears here and then some structures here as well. And then, and then between them, you get a big dump of, of, of trigenous sediment that's coming from, uh, from the Rio Grande River. And uh, you can make out like a number of channel uh, channelized features that's kind of emanating from that protuberance on the on the shelf edge. Um, some of them are buried by mass transport complexes, it looks like, especially in the upper part of the slope. So zooming in, uh, this is what it looks like. You get a number of these channelized features, and a lot of them are, or a few of them are buried, which I'll show you in a minute from John's uh, nice PhD thesis uh, dissertation. Um, and then they, they feed something that's been previously interpreted to be the Rio Grande fan, which is, is really just a bunch of weakly confined uh, channels that coalesce um, across another break in slope and form the um, Perdido Canyon. And I don't have public data to show what happens to that, but it goes for another like 100 kilometers or so into Mexican water and uh, forms another fan. So kind of interesting. But again, it's this, I, this scenario where you don't see a big, deeply sized canyon like we were looking at in Southern California, right? So here's a north-south, north-south uh, seismic reflection profile from John, and it's imaging like the upper few hundreds of milliseconds of the subsurface. And just the idea is, is that, you know, real close to the shelf edge, you go right from um, this shelf edge delta protuberance, delta complex protuberance to a number of laterally offset um, uh, levied channel uh, deposits. Um, we don't just see it there. Here's an example of the Magdalena fan. Uh, you, you know, you get, it almost looks like uh, you spilled spaghetti off the edge of the shelf and then you get all these sinuous channels that emanate from it. Um, this has been uh, worked on by a number of people and then here's a seismic line from a cruise that um, the, you know, the legendary deep water sedimentologist stratigrapher Carlos Pirmez put together and it's um, showing a number of these levee channel systems that's extending across the basin floor, not the slope, but the basin floor in the system. But again, you don't see like a, re a single dominant deeply incised canyon, right? Okay, opportunity. There's a ton of data in the Gulf of Mexico and, um, to explore these types of systems. Here's a look at the, from the BOEM website of the distribution of 2D data and um, you know, 3D is a little bit more, a little less impressive, and I think I'm missing a number of volumes here, but um, still, that's pretty darn good. That's like across the whole, like, northern part of the Gulf of Mexico. And in particular, there's a huge survey that's east of the Mississippi River um, that's highlighted in white right here. So let's zoom into that. So zooming in, um, a number of other volumes that are, uh, overlay that area, but we're really going to focus on this this huge, uh, this huge volume, big aerially extensive volume. And this is the first slide that I more or less showed you about where we're going with this. Um, you know, you get the outlines of uh, delta lobes of the uh, Mobile River. Um, we get this beautiful, huge um, uh, 3D seismic reflection uh, data set that we're working with. Um, and then all these black dots are uh, um, different types of shallow penetrating cores. I think they're mostly like piston cores that have been collected by um, LSU, a lot of these, studying the Lanyap Delta, which is the youngest lobe of the Mobile River Delta. And, um, and it's, a lot of that work was done by people like um, Jim Coleman and Harry Roberts, especially Harry Roberts, like pioneered a lot of that type of work as part of a consortium that's investigating the Lanyap Delta at LSU. And then um, Shell has done a lot of work on these two um, levied channel systems linked to this uh, delta. And, um, and I'm going to show you some insights into the lithology that penetrates this uh, easternmost channel called Einstein. 
Okay, uh, just to give you an idea about the age, there's some age control from uh, uh, micropaleontology as well as um, oxygen isotope records and radiocarbon. Um, to, you know, for, for timing, temporal context of, of, of when these delta lobes are active. And it turns out that well, here's an oxygen isotope record, and then the different oxygen and isotope stages are listed on the right. And then I've just put the ages uh, like on the far right. So you know what we're talking, what types of, um, how many thousands of years ago we're talking. And um, this uh, delta lobe here that looks, um, it's, a, it's a complex of delta lobes, actually. It, uh, it's active. It's, the, the timing of it is kind of not, not very well constrained, but it's active sometime um, back, you know, through, like between oxygen isotope stage 11 and, and, and 21. But, and some people have placed it at very specifically around 800,000 years old. It's active first, and then, um, then the delta lobes uh, switch to the west, closer to the, um, you know, the location of the Mississippi River or the Pearl River. And, um, and you have a delta, like kind of protuber deltaic protuberance here, and then a big one here that forms the lanyap. And, um, uh, w you know, the, the one that, these are the ones that we're going to really be focusing on. This is like the new mapping that we've been pursuing. And they're ac active around oxygen isotope stage 8 to 6. And then there's a, a lanyap delta lobe that was just active during the last glacial maximum. So that's kind of helpful, you know. Um, and so the next uh, slide, what I'm going to do is um, a lot of our new mapping is focused here on the Dorsey and Sounder. And then, um, but, but first I'm going to kind of introduce you to this region and some of the uh, work that's been, been done by the Shell Group focused on the, um, uh, focusing on the Fuji-Einstein um, system. So I'm going to provide this review of those, uh, those channels. And then, um, because it's been really thoroughly worked up, and then we're going to compare some of what we see there to, to what we... Um, what we see just next door. And a lot of the work that was done in this Fuji-Einstein system is, was, was done by, um, by Zoltan Sylvester, who's a co-PI of the QCL, and his colleagues at Shell, like Brad Prather and um, uh, Carlos Pirmez and uh, Alessandro Cantelli and these people. Um, and uh, and there's, there's been a lot of legacy Shell work that's not, hasn't been as published as much by like Charlie Winker that establishes a lot of the stratigraphic framework here. So um, check out their work for sure, especially that paper by Zoltan in 2012 is like the best paper on shelf margin um, stratigraphy that I've ever read. So, so, uh, so, so review of the system, what's there, and then a focus on how the channels initiate. Remember, that's kind of what we're, what we're focused on in the context of these shelf margin depositional systems. So, uh, so here is a uh, here's like a, um, a slope map from the um, from that that dashed region that I showed on the previous slide. Um, the showing really focusing on these uh, Fuji and Einstein uh, levied channels. Um, I, the Fuji one is active first, and then it, and I'll show you some cross sections later that demonstrate that it's active first, and then it, then the then the Einstein channel system is active. They're all linked to individual delta lobes. Um, and then uh, later we're going to talk about these channels that are to the west. Okay, so this is a, uh, oh shoot, I don't have a scale. Sorry about that, but these are a couple of kilometers of, I have scales on like everything else. These are a couple of kilometers of distance between one and the other. And this is a, um, I think it's like a structure map. So Zoltan gave me this yesterday. So this is a structure map uh, on the base horizon of the, these, these two channels, right, that are active a long time ago. And, um, and then superimposed on it is uh, a, uh, a thickness interpretation for the systems with red being relatively thick and the blues being relatively thin. And, um, and so this is kind of the thick associated with these Fuji Einstein, this Fuji Einstein um, shelf edge delta complex. And then these are, this is the um, Fuji and this is the Einstein channel and another and something I want to like kind of point it, point it, point out that Zoltan pointed out in his paper is that you get all these linear uh, gully features even these these kind of faint gully features between the channels um, that are adjacent to the um, the channel systems right at their base and so the kind of the interpretation an interpretation for how these things formed is that you know terrigenous sediment is exiting the delta mouth. Um, from, from these shelf edge delta lobes, and, and, and it's, you know, incising these really low relief but very linear gully forms, and then just one of the gullies ends up, you know, taking a lot more of the sediment than the other ones, and that's, that leads over time, lots more discharge through that single gully, you end up developing, a, a, you know, a, a bigger, um, more deeply incised and, and more mature looking, that is, it has like sinuosity uh, channel system. Um, so that's kind of the, the idea about how you don't see you see some evidence for mass wasting like you see this discontinuity right 
right here, um, like within the, the linear gully forms, um, but it's not like a heck of a lot of relief on that scar. You're not moving a heck of a lot of sediment down the slope. It's not one of these um, shelf attached, like Lorena Muscardelli has this idea of these really massive shelf, shelf attached mass wasting um, processes that can move a heck of a lot of sediment downstream. These are kind of little babies that are moving a little bit of sediment downstream. So the next, what I'm going to show is an animation that goes from here to the basin floor where these channels kind of terminate. So, Jill, do you have a question or something? Well, the two that are big, mm. head, the head holes are big. Things. Sorry? <clears throat> the two channels that have become large uh -huh. have quite big failures at the back end. Let's, let's um, keep that in mind about how big these canyon or these these channelized heads are compared to a major failure of a delta well, of this size that, yeah but i would say saying that the gullies don't have much failure at the back they're not the active sediment feeders in a big way right yeah, yeah yeah totally and these things have almost almost certainly headward eroded into the delta complex right so, mm. yeah absolutely so okay here we go so moving down you can just see how this thing changes the texture at the bottom of these channels, the salt diapir, so this is a salt diapir that you didn't pick over the top of, and those linear features kind of extend pretty good distance down the, down the slope. And then we don't, we don't know what happens beyond this. I mean, for one thing, there's no data. <laughs> for two, there's a huge mass transport complex that's emanating from probably DeSoto Canyon to the east that wipes out a lot of the whatever was beyond these channels. So just kind of want to make the point, here's that Einstein Canyon head that Jill was highlighting that was eroded into the thick of the delta complex, and then adjacent to it are a number of these um, sort of linear gully, gully features. And this is all in uh, Zoltan's paper. So back to this kind of overview slide. Um, next slide is going to be this dash box region, just to give you an idea of what some of the channels look like within these levee channels. Um, so this is, uh, so, so, so Zoltan mapped all these these regional horizons, and then he also mapped um, some of the individual channelized elements uh, that were that were well that were that were mappable, you know, across uh, pretty good distances to get an idea of what the basic building blocks of these levee channel um, uh, depositional systems were. And this is just one of those. Um, this is the base of one of those ch channel elements, so you can get an idea of how big they are. They're you know a couple hundred meters meters wide. Um, Here's what they look like in cross-section, and, and Shell collected um, cores as well to confirm, and, and, and collected a geophysical log suite in order to confirm what the lithology was. And um, it's kind of hard to see the, the couple of logs that we have adjacent to those, um, adjacent to the color coding, but the color coding, the grays are like muddy, and, and the, the, the oranges are a little bit more heterolithic, so a mix of interbedded mud and, and sand that's common to levee overbank deposits. And then the, the yellow is like your good sand. And so the yellow is just, so this is the levee, this is a levee, and then this is the channel um, uh, system like that's bounded by those levees, confined by those levees. And then the sand is really restricted to the base, the basal part of the whole system where you might have some kind of like splay develop or the, the axis of the, um, of the channel system itself. A lot of everything else is mud. And, they, and the folks that had interpreted the shallow used it as a reservoir analog for the deep, the deep Miocene in um, this region, in, this, in the same part of, uh, of the eastern Gulf of Mexico. This Hackbarth and Shoe is one of the first papers to really talk about Fuji Einstein in a lot of detail. And um, this might look like the seismic profile, like a diagram of the seismic profile that I just showed of the shallow subsurface, but it's actually um, an interpretation of the Ram Powell field, which is Miocene in age. And um, and it's the same type of thing. Like you get this a potentially like extensive bed of sand at the bottom of the system, and then um, a lot of the sand is focused on the channels at the very bottom of the levied um, uh, channel system. So, uh, so those are kind of the channel elements that are being fed by this delta. Another kind of interesting architectural element of these systems is you get these mud belt elements. So um, here's Fuji and here's Einstein. And, um, and then this is a, uh, a thickness map that Zoltan uh, created on the top of the Fuji Einstein and then um, over a, a, um, another horizon that was regionally mapped um, adjacent to the Fuji Einstein Delta complex. This is the, actually the younger Delta front that I'm going to show you a lot more detail about later. But you see there's a thick, the red indicates a thick, and then um, 
the idea is contour currents uh, potentially related to like a proto loop current or something. I'm not exactly sure there. They're reworking some of the delta front um, muddy sediment along a contour, and it's it's basically draping and filling in the um, the abandoned uh, levee channels where Zoltan was working. So you can see the thick of the adjacent delta. There's a younger delta, and then you get these these thicks of mud that kind of drape the whole uh, upper part of the slope. So that's another sort of architectural element that um, I, I hadn't really thought about before I, you know, read the read these papers. So this is a real simplistic view of the major depositional elements in Fuji Einstein. You get these shelf edge deltas that tend to be pretty sandy. Um, uh, you get the levee channel systems, the bottom of which are pretty sandy, and then you get you can get these mud belts that form. Uh, from adjacent delta lobes, and they're reworked by contour currents, uh, and kind of um, they compartmentalize the uh, more sand-prone shelf edge delta link to the levee channel systems. Okay, so that was here where this plot of the oxygen isotope curve is. Now, well, now we're shifting west, and this is new mapping that we've pursued on these two uh, channels. That again, they're linked to the Mobile River, but they're you know laterally offset. Um, compared to the Fuji and Einstein uh, levee channel system. So this is new mapping of a couple channels called um, Sounder and Dorsey. Um, again, same questions. What's there? And then how do the deep water channels initiate? That's what we're going to be trying to pursue. So, you know, I mentioned there's the 3D seismic. There's the shallow penetrating cores. Um, there's, uh, there's high resolution seismic as well. Here's a... Here's, um, a uh, a seismic reflection profile, a high resolution, there's 25 milliseconds for scale, seismic reflection profile of the last active um, Lanyap delta lobe, and these, uh, that was collected by um, Roberts and, and the LSU group um, for their consortium on the Lanyap delta. And then they, you know, they have age control, so they can actually define uh, the ages of some of these, uh, some of these uh, deposits. Um, we... There's a lot of this that we haven't quite explored yet. We really focus on just mapping the 3D seismic. It gives a much coarser perspective. But it's still, um, I'm just trying to highlight that there's this type of context, and there's cores, too, that give you lithologic context. Okay, so the previous slide that I just showed you is this uh, box region, and that was that um, well that I showed you with the different oxygen isotope stages identified. And this is, um, compared to that, this is the data that we've been working with. So much bigger... Um, much coarser resolution, but still not too not too darn bad, right? Um, here's the distribution of frequencies of our data. Here's the outline of our 3D, and then the um, the uh, the dashed line is this uh, seismic reflection profile from more or less west to to east. And we're focusing on the on the shallow section, like the upper 400 milliseconds or so. So. Um, a little interpretation. Uh, Fuji is here. Einstein's here. Really beautiful compensational stacking of the uh, of the transition from the shelf edge delta deposits to the levee channel deposits. And then this is what we and so Zoltan mapped a heck of a lot of this, uh, and we haven't remapped it. A lot of it was, the work was done at Shell. And then here's uh, mapping that we've been pursuing for the channel systems that are relatively uh, young. You can see how they are stacked on top of those Fuji and Einstein um, deposits. Uh, so uh, real br I'm going to go into a little bit more detail, but real briefly, the types of um, we, we recognize some major erosional surfaces. It's this yellow horizon here. We think that's the, kind of the base of the, um, represents the initiation of this of one of these channel systems, the Dorsey channel system, which is more to the west. And then, then you get another erosional surface that's this green horizon, and that's an, it's the base of another channel system. Um, then you have a, a muddier fill um, uh, on top of that, um, those deposits. Um, so I think the system's abandoned. And then um, you get a reincision um, related to uh, the last glacial maximum and, and, and deposition associated with the youngest delta lobe called the Lanyap. So that was a strike view. This is a dip view, and it's the same color coding, um, same, I same idea, just, you know, different, you know, dip view. <laughs> so uh, erosional surface here in yellow, another erosional surface in green. Um, we think that those, uh, that that, that um, terrigenous sediment dispersal system was abandoned at this uh, kind of blue, dark blue horizon, and, that's, and then you get these kind of... Um, moderate to high amplitude, but very continuous seismic reflections that we think represent, represent muddy abandonment. And you get a reincision um, here uh, around the um, last glacial maximum. 
Okay, so the next slides I'm going to show you, um, I, I told you, you know, we just started looking at this, and we just want to show you, this is really about, like, thinking about ways that sediment gets moved from one place to another, and how this is maybe, uh, um, I'm not going to say it's unique, because it might be common, but an uh, under-recognized thing. Um, uh, I also want to share some of the opportunity that we have with these data in order to image some of the features. So um, we, we've been with Dallas, mostly, or exclusively, <laughs> in our group has been working with PaleoScan, and so he quickly uh, picked a couple of horizons within the area of interest, like including the Fuji and Einstein Delta and, and Levy Channel complexes um, and the Sounder and Dorsey ones. And, uh, and then he just, and he didn't try to, he didn't try to do anything fancy with the, the paleo scan to get like the best image. You just wanted to see if you quick couple, pick a couple regional horizons and then you, uh, <laughs> what do we see? Can we see some of the features here? I think you'll be pretty impressed. This is um, the whole data set and this is a um, RMS amplitude extraction. So higher RMS is, is dark and um, it's going to be from the bottom of the, all of those channels I've been talking about to the, um, approaching the seafloor. So I'm just going to let it run. Some beautiful imaging of, of, of faults at the shelf edge. You can start to see the channels forming. Again, this is like Fuji, Einstein, and then this is Sounder Dorsey. You get some crazy looking uh, like speckled pattern in map view in this RMS amplitude extraction that probably represents uh, mass transport complex deposition. You start to see crescent shapes at the shelf edge. You can almost make out the, you know, the paleo delta um, locations at the shelf edge. And again, this has not like been tweaked and not been fine-tuned in any way to really make these features pop, okay? This is, and so things are not in perfect stratigraphic order or anything, but I think that it could be really great if we put more time and effort into it. So th that was amplitude. This is looking at just the frequency um, spectrum. So, uh, so we're looking at like a, a low, mid, and higher frequency content, and when they all intersect, you get like a white color, but it tends to make really beautiful images. So same idea, moving from bottom to top, you get beautiful imaging of the faults, beautiful imaging of the sinuous channels, right? Of the Fuji and Einstein and the Sounder and Dorsey. Uh, you can start to make out those blocks that I was talking about that are kind of like in this broad swath that seems to be bounded by channels. And those gully forms are pretty clear as well, relatively linear gullies. I'm gonna zoom into um, uh, the Einstein channel. And then there's Fuji and Einstein again. You, so this, the channel doesn't just terminate here. It's because we're not, we haven't really worked this paleo scan software like we should to get perfectly flat images. But you can already see some really neat features with respect to bend migration that we didn't notice before. Look at this one right here. Some crazy looking textures that might be related to mass transport complex emplacement, more like fan emplacement in some places. Very excited. And so I showed this to Zoltan. Zoltan worked with like the best data available at the time. And these are older BOEM data, and it looks pretty darn good, you know, for free data. Okay, so this is Sounder and Dorsey, just a quick close-up view. These are probably sediment waves that form maybe as the delta gets to the shelf edge and starts to transport trigenous sediment down onto the slope. Um, you can see the Sounder and Dorsey channels, and we're just going to move up. You can see their sinuous forms really beautifully, I think. Some cutoffs are apparent as well. There's this little guy, this little cute, um, relatively narrow channel form. Um, look at that. Ugh, that's probably a uh, mass transport complex that's emanating from some failure scars I'm going to show you later. And then channels form on either side of it. Okay. So it's a little bit of eye candy and more like the promise of, um, of these data. Um, so uh, back, this is our, um, our area of interest. There's that Lanyap Delta. These are those Fuji-Einstein Delta uh, complexes. Um, we're going to be looking at a number of strike lines focusing on the Sounder and Dorsey channels moving from, uh, from uh, the north to the south, so from proximal to distal. And I'm just going to highlight some of the stratigraphy that we're interpreting. So again, this yellow horizon we think is an erosional horizon that defines a failure scar. And in, inside it, you get the development of a channel. So you kind of create that template for channels to form down the slope. Um, then you get another erosional uh, surface here, this, this uh, green one. Um, there you abandon around this blue horizon, and you get these really continuous um, moderate to um, you know, transitional high amplitude seismic reflection packages that are probably muddy. Um, this here, this little downlap, this is the little thin uh, uh, Lanyap Delta, that's the last active delta associated with the Mobile River that gets to the shelf edge, and then you, um, 
uh, you've, you've incised at the bottom, and then you, the delta prograde's over the top, and then you get abandonment. And then this is uh, an onlapping uh, wedge of mud that might be one of these mud belts, or it might just be, um, it's probably a mud belt because it's actually lapping onto it. I don't know for sure. Okay, moving downstream. Um, so you went from those big erosional surfaces to, uh, you know, there's um, some erosion evidence on the bottom of this yellow horizon here, um, but they get a really chaotic texture immediately above it, and then you get some more high amplitude discontinuous seismic character. Um, it's hard to see in this one, but just above the yellow horizon. So again, we think that, that this is an erosional surface related to mass failure, and then you fill it with a chaotic mass transport complex, and that forms kind of a template for channelization. Um, green horizon is another incision, um, then you get abandonment, and then you reincise again in this blue horizon. I'll show you what this looks like in map view in a minute. Continuing to move downstream, try not to get distracted by all the awesomeness that is uh, even lower in the section, or the salt diaper here, but it's the same type of story. Um, you can see the potential mass transport complexes I've colored in, in brown here that are just sitting right on top of those two erosional surfaces. They're thinner than they were. Um, and, and just like in the Fuji and Einstein, it looks like um, we were interpreting, we don't have core in these examples, but based on the insights from right next door, we think that a lot of the sand is focused at the bottom of those channels, right? Okay, this is, oh, is going to be really cool. Okay, so you get salt diaper here and here. Um, you know, you still have these um, incisions that are related to the channels. And then you move downstream and they all kind of coalesce. And I'll show you how the superposition works out. You can see it better in a map view. Um, but, um, you know, it's all forced by the topography of the, um, the rising salt diapirs that flank the channel system. Okay. So here's, so all those horizons that I kept pointing out to you, this is what they actually look like in map view. This is the, also the animation that I showed at the very beginning. Um, this is the base of, uh, this is that basal erosional surface. Um, that, uh, so, I've, so, so I got a little cross section here that corresponds with um, sort of channels somewhere in the middle of this image, um, uh, west, east, or yeah, west, east, and then I've, uh, you know, I've color coded all of the different horizons, and then I'm going to show, I'm going to illuminate in white which one the heck we're looking at. So this is an erosional surface. Um, look at these uh, several kilometer uh, um, uh, diameter uh, crescent, or not crescent might not be the right word, but like, you know, scour forms. We, we think that these are mass failures that are nucleating along this fault, and then, then that speckled pattern that I was trying to point out to you is a mass transport complex that corresponds with this, these, these failure surfaces. Um, so this is the bottom, and, um, and we think that this, uh, this Dorsey channel system was active first. You see how it, um, you know, extends from this scar here, and then there's another scar here, and it extends all the way down, um, down between those salt diapers to, to the basin floor. Um, and so we think this is really important, this idea of, you know, you, you get this fault here, um, the, there's a lot of sediment that's being delivered from the Mobile River, it overloads the shelf edge, and it promotes a lot of the mass wasting that forms a template for the channelization that we see here. So right above it, this is a much more smooth pattern that we see now in that Dorsey channel. And then this channel system, you can see a lot more of the sinuous loops, and it actually looks to, um, to uh, intersect, right? Like to cut, cut off isn't quite the right word because that has meanings or, you know, it means something else in the context of channels. But um, it seems to, uh, you know, like truncate uh, the previously active channel system and continue downstream. So that, we think, is this is the base of that next erosional surface that was in green, the sounder channel system. And then there's that abandonment surface that I talked about, and you can see all those channels that were formed are now, like, um, they're pretty smooth based. You don't see the nice sinuous loops that we saw before. Um, but then there's um, another incision um, associated with the Lanyap Delta during the last glacial maximum, and you can see more of these channelized features. And again, it looks like the, it's a much more narrow uh, channel, and it looks like it's, again, kind of uh, truncating um, the previously deposited channels in that much more smoother topography. And then this is the seafloor. That's what we get on the seafloor. Okay, so, you know, we're a quantitative classics lab, so we're going to measure some stuff. So this is some measurements. Here's the stratigraphy and cross-section. And then here's a histogram of the widths of um, the channels, you know, because we're seismic resolution doesn't really allow us to measure thickness of channels, thickness of the whole system maybe, but not thickness of individual channel elements. And um, But we can measure widths. You saw the detail that we saw in some of the um, paleo scan mapping, right? So, um, so the gray... Uh, 
uh, bars uh, represent that last active lanyap channel system, so it's much more narrow, remember? And so those channels are like up to like 100 meters wide, 150 meters wide, something like that. And then the Dorsey and Sounder, those, those, those ones that formed right after the big mass wasting, they're much wider, like up to 500 meters wide. And we also wanted to compare the widths of those channels to global databases of channel element widths that um, have been published, and um, just eyeballing it, it looks like the, uh, you know, there's overlap from what we're measuring and what's been measured, um, you know, very carefully across the world in outcropping channelized architectural elements. So that gives us some confidence that what we're seeing is actually real geology. Um, just for comparison, the Fuji Einstein is, it kind of lays right over the top of the Dorsey sounder, okay? So for us, when we see a channel that's relatively wide, we are thinking that there's a higher discharge of triginous sediment that's moving down it. And so, you know, you know, that's the same Mobile River that's feeding the Fuji, Einstein, Dorsey, Sounder channels, and so the fact that the darn channels are about the same scale makes a lot of sense. This Lanyap is smaller because it's only active for a little bit of time, and it's a smaller uh, delta lobe that's feeding it. So here's that kind of idea about the importance of the sediment supply from the, uh, from the delta. So here's a thickness map. So here's, our little, here's a cross section of the uh, shelf edge, and right where you get the failures, and then a, a cross section through the the, the lower part of the um, the lower part of the channel system, and uh, what I've highlighted here are the, um, the the lowermost erosional surface, that intermediate erosional surface, and then the abandonment surface in in orange, green, and blue, and I've highlighted those two. So so basically, this thickness map, this isochore map that I'm looking at, that I've mapped out here, is um, is between. It's like it's. It's from the bottom of the system to where it abandons and all that stuff that gets deposited in between. Um, so, I mean, it's got a big old thick shelf edge delta. It looks a heck of a lot like, um, like Zoltan's map of, um, of, uh, of the, the delta complex that forms at the edge of the Fuji Einstein. It's the same river, remember, that's feeding these channel systems. And, and you know, correspondingly, the... Uh, the channels here in Fuji Einstein are about the same sort of dimensions, and they look like the darn same character, at least in map view, as, um, as what uh, Zoltan's mapped in great detail in Fuji Einstein. So we think that, you know, because the deltas are about the same, it's probably getting a similar amount of sediment supplied to the shelf edge, and then that, um, that similar sediment supply, similar discharge into the canyon channel system is creating really similar scale of, of channels. Um, for comparison, um, here's our cross section again, and here's the thin, relatively ephemeral Lanyap uh, Delta channel system, and you get a little baby Delta here, and the, whole, the, the focus of the Lanyap Delta is more to the, to the west. This is like a little lobe offshoot of the Lanyap Delta complex, and it forms a little, uh, you know, very thin uh, channel form. So, uh, revisiting this question we had, how does sediment get into deep water? You know, um, pioneering efforts in Southern California suggest you get one canyon, one master canyon that is for a long time active in supplying sediment through levee channel systems and feeding depositional lobes. Um, but there are these cases like the Rio Grande that I showed and the Eastern Gulf of Mexico and, um, and the Magdalena and um, uh, the Niger Delta that don't have like one giant canyon. They have a delta complex at the shelf edge that's feeding a ton of levee channel systems, right? Um, so yeah, I kind of went through that. Lobe switching at the self ed shelf edge creates this broad arcuate delta complex and this broad arcuate swath of uh, deep water deposits downstream of it as well. So um, our question, you know, when we started was how does sediment get into deep water um, in, in different types of environments? Uh, we think that we have an example of that second model in the eastern Gulf of Mexico where you get this broad delta complex feeding multiple of these uh, levee channels. Um, so we provided this review, um, we documented what was there, and then we, and we're trying to um, explore how the channels initiate in these types of, in these types of settings. Um, so just to kind of summarize, you know, we defined these the key architectural elements, like what's there and then how to get there, we're starting to, we're starting to hypothesize how it got there, right? Um, uh, but there's a lot more opportunity for improvement. So you get these, you know, these, these mass failure scars, you get these big, deeply incised channels, you get gullies all over the place. Um, and then what might be controlling the scale of the channels we see, we think that a lot of it has to do with sediment supply from the Mobile 
uh, delta, um, there's shelf margin faults uh, sort of nucleate, and you saw some of those beautifully, I think, in the paleo scan movies that Dallas created for us. Um, they nucleate right at the shelf edge, and that creates you know, a location to nucleate these, these failures that create mass transport complexes around which the, um, the, the levied channels descend across the slope. Um, yeah, so it's this template for channelization. So yeah, I'll just kind of leave you with this image. Um, uh, and uh, ask for any questions. There's lots more to do. I want to say that for sure. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Jake. Questions? I see one already. So, Jake, in Southern California, it's notable that the canyons are not where the sediment gets, where the rivers dump the sediment into the basin. They are at various locations. All right. right? So um, when... I looked at this working with Embari. There was this idea that fluid seepage is a mm -hmm. key component of um, this headward encroachment of the canyons and the slumping on the sides of the canyons. So, yeah. in other words, the canyons are not just a process of incision yes. by sediment transport, and maybe the sediment transport is almost secondary, uh -huh. but the fluid seepage from compaction and other various um, drivers for fluid flow are actually determining almost where the canyons form, in some ways also tectonically controlled. Yeah, yeah. Um, and since you talked a little bit about how those canyons form, mm -hmm. what do you think is the impact of the significance of fluid seepage on... You son of a gun, that's a great question. That's exactly where we want to go. Like, we think a key is the formation of the canyons is key for whether you get one case or the other. Like the Magdalena Delta is a really large sediment load, um, but you don't get like a big canyon like you do in, in other places, you know. So, um, uh, so in Southern California, I, I, I appreciate that sometimes there's this seepage process that might be active, but also the tectonics I think is really important. Like a lot of, because it's a lot of it's longshore drift fed, and you get all these like, um, little, uh, I keep saying protuberance, I should think of a different word, but these like, you know, discontinuities in the coast that act almost as like catcher's mitts for, for, for turgenous sediment transported by longshore currents. That's why um, Mount Soldat is, uh, is, is a, is a pop-up st structure that forms as a result of the Rose Canyon fault taking a left step. So it's a right lateral strike that fault and it takes a left step. And then, so it just kind of like all this sediment from all these really flashy rivers gets transported right there. And so that might, you know, create some of the overburden just by having a big pile of sediment that facilitates the development of the channel. Weakness along the fault plane, too. Um, and there's also deltas that feed. I, it's not, there aren't no deltas in Southern California. In one of the images that I showed, there's a, uh, there's a river that drains adjacent to, like, the southern part of the L.A. Basin called the Santa Ana River, and it forms, like, a little, you know, uh, delta that feeds the Newport and Newport Channel system. So, um, I guess I'm just kind of elaborating a bit on some of the processes for canyon formation in Southern California, and I want to acknowledge that, yes, yeah, some of these other processes about, like, I guess you were talking about, like, fluid flow and, and seepage in the subsurface promoting weakness that um, localizes submarine canyons. Yeah, yeah I've heard those, too. Um, but I really want to highlight that we think that the... The I, I I think I don't want to like lump Zoltan into this okay but um, I think that the the control on the canyon formation is like fundamentally important and that's where we want this research to go. Does that kind of like address your question or? Okay. No, I was just going to add to that. Okay. I was just going to add to that actually. I I think seepage is is probably quite important as a process, but I think it might actually in the cases of these very high sediment supply systems actually be responsible for that incredibly strong fabric of linear gullies all the way along the foot, I think it's more likely to be giving rise to that fabric. But what I think is really important, I totally agree with Jake, is these big failure scars that arise when you start to get the growth faults mm -hmm, at the yeah. front of the delta. Yeah, yeah. That process of failure and then progressive erosion, then healing and then reprogradation, that cycle is really important. Yeah, I totally agree. And I hadn't often seen it in like this in seismic where you get like the nice scar and then you get the channel like right on top of it. And so I was excited. Yeah. I've seen it in out, I've, I've arm waved about it in an outcrop. Like I worked on some rocks in Chile, um, these shallow marine rocks that had a huge erosional surface and on, and on top of it were a bunch of um, 
like turbidites, like pro-delta turbidites probably. And I kind of said, yeah, it could be a failure scar, and then it's a, you know, it's precursor for a bigger channel. Um, but that's a lot of this. And this, you can actually see what it looks like in 3D. Yeah. Yep. I thought that was a great, beautiful presentation. There's something that I think you could very usefully use as a comparison, which is um, the barrow formation um, of Western Australia and going into the Carnarvon Basin, which looks just like this. Oh, cool. there's, there's a, a shed load of work's been done on it. And what, what you see there is, is hundreds and hundreds of linear slope gullies, uh, maybe a dozen of, of, of these channels um, go, go, going down the slope. And they're all beautifully imaged on 3D data, which should be available publicly now. But what's interesting there is that you see the whole system, and at the end of, of all those systems are little piddly slope gullies and fairly insignificant looking channels. There's the biggest honking fan, the Scarborough fan, nice, which yeah. is a huge mega tank of multi-Darcy sand at the end. Um, so that would be an interesting comparison to use because the data is there. It's all been worked up. Yeah, cool. We probably it's, have it. It's, right? yeah, I'm sure we probably do. So is it Angel? Is it Angel? No. What is it? Barrow formation. Barrow. Oh, the Barrow. Yeah. Barrow. B-A-R-R-O-W. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. uh, basal Barrow particularly. Anyway, so it brings me on to the, the comment I wanted to make on, on this talk is, is, is really nice talking about how the sediment gets to the shelf edge and starts going down the slope. The one thing you very carefully avoided saying is what happens to the sediment when it gets to the end? Where does it go? Is there a big honking fan at the end? Right. Is that your question or is that just a comment that I avoided saying? It? Oh, okay, yeah. So, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. So, uh, fortunately, unfortunately, there's a big mass, tra like, there's mass transport complex coming from DeSoto Canyon that, you know, it makes it impossible to see what's happening. And we don't have data, also, we have 2D, but, but you don't see what's happening or we didn't see, maybe you have better ideas. And then here you get uh, failure from the, um, like the, from the west. That's, there's a lot of mass, mass wasting that is obscuring the basin floor, uh, seafloor topography. And, um, and I haven't looked at the subsurface to see if there's like a fan that is still preserved there. Have you seen anything or? Of this equipment. Yeah. I've looked at the data, but not noticed what's there. Yeah, I've looked at some 2D, and I didn't see anything, and I was kind of annoyed about that. But, you know, um, it is what it is. So. Yeah, yeah, totally. It would be really, really cool to actually work out how much the failure itself gives rise to sand at the base, and then how that then gets more organized. I mean, I, yeah, yeah. I would hypothesize because of what we see in the Pliocene, you yeah. get a... Um, an increased organization channels get going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep, yeah. totally. Yeah. Jake, oh, uh, hey. you know, very nice eye candy. Uh, Got to figure out how to make figures like that myself. But, uh, okay. but in any case, this, uh, but in some ways, you're looking at sort of a frozen in low stand geomorph submarine geomorphology. Mm -hmm. And so, like, you know, this might be applicable for the last three million years, but can you comment? How does sort of, you know, how you would extrapolate yeah. this back when you do not have low stand deltas to sort of like rapidly yeah. dump a lot of sediment right at the shelf edge that sort of will lead to these to these failures? Totally. And so whether this is actually sort of extrapolatable into the deeper time. Absolutely is. And actually Shell started this project just to do that in the Miocene. And and if you can figure out the characteristics of a system, um, you can start to apply these types of models. Like if you're getting shelf, uh, if you're getting deltas out to the shelf edge, if if you think that that's happening, that could maybe happen even more often in like greenhouse type situations. You get sh deltas off to the shelf, up out, out to the shelf edge, and they just park there. Then this is really, uh, really applicable. So it's absolutely applicable to reservoirs in the Miocene just below, <laughs> and then it could be applicable to a vi wide variety of other places. And I'll push back a bit about the um, frozen in time thing, because this is more than seafloor, looking at the seafloor and taking pictures. This is like um, my wrist, my, um, my repetitive stress injury is testament to uh, clicking a lot of Clicking around and documenting a lot of stratigraphy. So, yeah. Oh, but can, you on, uh, can you comment on what's happening in between? When, you know, how do you, how does it make it in deep water when your delta is not parked? Oh, right. Yeah. Well, so here I don't I don't know exactly what's 
what's happening, but the conventional wisdom is that you're, you have accommodation on the shelf, and so it's getting stored there. I mean, you can, that's the opportunity here, too, is linking to those deltas, and what's the timing of the deltas relative to the timing of the deep water channels? Um, I guess uh, one comment on that goes to the Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, awesome. That's a great point from Zoltan's, a great result from Zoltan's paper, actually. Okay. All right, really good conversation. Thank yep, you. We're over our time. How about